So everyone, good morning and uh, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Good to see you. Hope you all are doing well. Hello, Enoch. Hey, Sid. Hello, Anita. Aradna. Hi, John. Hello, Collins. Hi. Good to see you guys. Good to see you. Well, welcome uh, to uh, the course Ministering Divine Healing. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to request one of you to uh, lead us in, in, in prayer this morning. Uh, anyone, feel free to go ahead and lead us, please. Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you. Father, we come to the throne of grace, Lord. Thank you for this day you have given us, Lord, this day. As we are going to listen from your word, Lord, we are going to learn. Thank you. Lord, so for this opportunity you have given us, Lord, the hours we are going to spend, Lord, whatever we will be learning, Lord, give us wisdom, knowledge, and your guidance, Lord, so that we can learn effectively and should be added for your ministry, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you, Sid. Okay, um, so let's get started. And, um, and as always, uh, as I always like to do, um, can uh, you all just share either one or two points that you kind of remember or uh, have learned or helped you, uh, you know, so far in everything, what, whatever we've covered? Is there something that stood out uh, that kind of ministered to you and you learned it? Uh, what are a couple of things that, that, you, that you've caught so far? Just very few of us you can unmute and speak. With. It's God's intention for us to be healed, and He wants us to be uh, in full health. And also, when we minister, we minister according to how Jesus ministered when He was on earth. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, we, we see God's will that we've learned so far that um, uh, it's interesting that we start with that because we're going to get into that. Um, yeah, and we learn from how Jesus ministered by, uh, during his earthly ministry. Yeah, anybody else? Sid, want to share? Hi, Sarathori. Good morning. Hello, Lyndon. Thanks for joining, Subhashish. Thanks for joining. Right, so I've just started off with a question asking, um, you know, what have you, uh, what has stood out so far that you've learned, uh, you know, in the course that we've covered, in the course material that we've covered so far? One thing that stood out that ministered to you with, that you, that you think it was helpful for you in this journey of administering divine healing. Okay, Aradhana. Okay, I know you guys can hear me because John responded. Okay, uh, Subhashish, you all now respond. Okay. Wait, now, now I got to ask that question. You all can hear me, right? Yes, no, maybe. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, we can hear you, sir. Okay. Yeah, then. Why isn't anyone responding to my question? Okay. Right. Um, Zelipoli, you want to share what you've learned so far? Anything that's stood out in the course content? Um, 
the one thing which stood out was like a uh, miracle it just uh, demonstrate God's compassion that how Jesus uh, Jesus minister with compassion during his earthly ministry so it's a good reminder as a minister of God to move me with compassion and minister to the people according to Renee's yeah thank you Zoe. yeah um, to move in compassion just like once again like uh, Jesus yeah and, you know, uh, was that by mistake or you want to share? <laughs> um, good morning, once again, good morning, lecturer. Um, without the message of God, ministry can never move forward. Uh, with message of God, healing takes place because it's mm -hmm. mercy and you're right forever. Yeah. So I've learned a lot. Mm -hmm that I cannot even explain that I'm applying to my life and my ministry. That's wonderful to hear. Amen. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, thank you for sharing. And also, once again, you know, as I always say, uh, I'm asking a question. It's really not to put you on a spot or, uh, you know, or it's because I want to hear the right answer. So, so there's no right or wrong answer. Um, so feel free, be bold, uh, you know, and... Uh, and share, share your thoughts, whatever you want. I'm, I'm sure you've learned a lot, and that was the question. Um, and so I just wanted to hear you share. And I think by sharing what your point can rem can be a reminder to another person, oh, yes, we learned about this as well, uh, in addition to what you've already learned. Right? So it's good to share. It's good to speak. It's, it's okay. And uh, I realize it's, for some of us, it's very early in the morning. <laughs> and for, for some of us, it doesn't matter the time of the day it's always early <laughs> right but anyways good uh, it's um it's good i'm looking forward for today's class and i hope you get to learn a lot more today as well okay let me go ahead and share the screen um, so we can follow along in the notes just give it a second Okay. Great. So uh, this was one of the last point uh, when it come, came to basis for ministering, healing, and deliverance. Uh, what we learned was it is our commission, uh, right? So we've been commissioned to go and preach the gospel of the kingdom and to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and to cast out devils. Right? We've been commissioned. Uh, right? We've been given that authority. Uh, you know, we've been commanded. And that has to sink in. Okay, uh, it is. It is. We are not. We are not just praying for the sake for the sake uh, of it. Um, but we've been sent. We are co-partnering, co-laboring. We are in co-mission uh, with the vision of God. Okay, that is to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and to cast out devils. Okay, we have been commissioned to do the same. So that that was one of the uh, final points we covered, and we see that. We addressed one of the important questions in conclusion was, is it God's will to heal everyone? Uh, and uh, John shared that, it, you know, it, it's God's will, right? even before we got to this point. But we've seen with everything that we've learned that he desires us for us to be whole. Right? He desires us to be uh, in, in, in that perfect design that he intended uh, to be before the fall happened. Right? He wants to see his children well and complete and whole, right? to, live a, to live a long life, like he, like he mentions in the world. Right? So, so yes, God's will is to heal everyone okay, of any physical condition if they, will, if they will come in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, just as people did in the Bible. We can minister healing and deliverance with confident, confidence that it is God's will to heal anyone who comes to him in faith. Amen. Uh, let's, we should, let's try and get this, uh, you know, drill it into our heads. So we can minister divine healing uh, and deliverance with confidence that it is God's will. So the answer to that question is very simple. Yes, it is God's will to heal everyone. Right? And we see that Jesus demonstrated the healing to all who came to him in faith. Isn't it? Uh, he healed all who came to him. Right? Uh, 
Jesus's mission when he in his earthly ministry was to the house of the Jews, right, to the Hebrews. But then we also see him ministering to the Gentiles, right. So he healed all who came to him in faith, and we see um, so many examples, so many scriptures that that kind of support that statement. Uh, from Matthew chapter 4 and in all of this we've read these scriptures multiple times but I think um, if, if you don't mind I'm going to just want to read a couple of scriptures um, it's just something it, just to encourage our faith once again so Matthew 4 23 24 it says and Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and that he doesn't stop there and then healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria. Matthew 8, 16 says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with the word and he and healed all who were sick. Matthew 12, 15, But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Right. So I think um, uh, we can keep going because they're all so wonderful, and they're all testimonies of what Jesus did. Amen. Uh, I think uh, it's it is possible for us sometimes to uh, overlook and just read it as a bunch of words put together. But then when we just pause, take time to realize and understand that. These are all the testimonies of Jesus, of what he did, right? What your Lord and Savior, what, you know, he's our Lord and Savior. He's our King of Kings. He's our Father, right? And it's so wonderful It's to read the stories of what our Father did in, on his earthly ministry, during his earthly ministry, right? It's just wonderful. Uh, it never gets old. Um, so that's where we stop. And uh, let's resume for, um, and, and if you have a PDF, I'm on page 57, but uh, I'm sharing it on the screen anyways for us to all follow. And, and all of that is simply because the cross is for everyone, right? Is the cross is only for an elite few people? No, cross is for uh, all. Yeah, so. It's, it's God's will to heal everyone because the cross is for everyone, right? It is his will. It, just, it's, it's not just the Jews or the Christians are, are his children. We are all made in the image of God, isn't it? And so uh, if it's his will to heal everyone, that means the cross is for everyone. Simple. Okay, so since... The finished work of the cross is for everybody. Forgiveness for sins, healing for body and mind is also for everybody. Amen. And so we see uh, here the notes, as we have studied earlier, healing and deliverance and wholeness are provided through the cross of Jesus Christ. The price Jesus paid on the cross is for the entire human grace okay uh, let's go to 1 john chapter 2 verse 2 and see uh, what it says 1 john chapter 2 verse 2 it says he is the atonement atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours but for also the sins of the whole world okay that's for what was 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. I want to read that again. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. Beautiful, isn't it? So Jesus paid the same price and made the same provision for every single person. Right? And all that Jesus did on the cross is available for anyone who will believe. Right? Since the finished work of the cross is for everybody, then forgiveness for sins, healing for body and mind is also for everybody, right? Um, and so on, on the similar lines, because the cross is for everyone, 
God's promise of salvation is also for everyone. Okay, uh, the promise of the gift of salvation is for everyone. Now, the salvation, uh, the Greek word used there, as you can see in the notes, is the word sozo. Okay, we're going to learn a little bit more about that word uh, you know, in just a minute. Uh, and you can see it's mentioned over 100 and, uh, 110 times. And it's the most commonly used Greek word for salvation in the New Testament. So what does it mean? Sozo is a verb, an action word. It means to do. It is doing something. Okay, uh, Something that is done, something that happens because of a work of God. Okay, um, So the word sozo is translated as forgiveness, healed, preserved, depending on the context. Okay, Forgiveness, healed, preserved depending on what the context is, right? Um, so we see here, sozo means forgiveness of sins um, in all these scriptures. It means physical healing. It means deliverance from demonic powers. It means to be rescued and be preserved from danger. Sozo is for everyone. It means salvation is for everyone. Sozo is received by grace through faith. Okay, we got to remember that we receive but through it's a it, sozo is, is received by grace through faith and sozo happens when you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth right romans 10 chapter uh, chapter 10 verse 13 to be specific if anyone who believes will declare see and believes in the lord jesus christ uh, is saved right so that is the meaning uh, of the word sozo so um God's prom God, the cross is for everyone. Uh, God's promise of salvation is for everyone. Okay. Um, so with, with all of that in mind, uh, we come back to this question in, in connection. Now that we've learned, we've seen that it is God's will to heal everyone. Um, you know, the, because the cross is for everyone. And because the cross is for everyone who believes, salvation is, for, is made available for everyone and anyone who believes, right? And so having discussed all of that, is it right to pray, if it be thy will, when ministering healing and deliverance? It simply, you know, the question simply means, okay, can we pray, is it, is it right to pray, Lord, if it's your will, let this person be healed? Okay, let's, uh, let's see what the notes uh, have to say. Uh, Collins, uh, do you raise your hand? Yes, I thought it was a question, Pastor. It's okay, let's continue. Okay, all right. Yeah, okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, so here it says, having established the fact that it is God's will for everyone uh, who comes to him in faith to be healed, there remains no place then for us to pray, if it be thy will. Okay. I want to read that one more time very carefully. So having established the fact that it is God's will for everyone, and I hope that all of us are on page, on the same page, right? Or do we have to have a debate about is it God's will or not? Okay. Um, but I think, I hope that we are all in agreement that it is God's will to heal everyone who comes to him in faith, right? Um, so there remains no place, no room, okay, for doubt than for us to pray if it be thy will. When ministering healing and deliverance, we already know God's will in this matter. We know, isn't it? We know God's will is for everyone to be healed and delivered if they are willing to believe. Right? Um, the only time, uh, I mean, we never see uh, Jesus praying, if it be thy will, when ministering healing and deliverance. Uh, we saw so many scriptures there, right? In Matthew and Mark about how Jesus healed everybody. He was moved in compassion and he healed all who came to him. Um, and nowhere there does it mention that he asks and prays, Jesus prays that, Lord, Father, if it is your will, please heal, heal them. No, he just heals them. Amen. And the only time he said, not as I will, but as your will, is in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prepared to go to the cross. Right? 
um, you know, and you you would have heard a lot of uh, men uh, men of God preachers, evangelists, pastors. Uh, you know, when they give an altar call, uh, they say, you know, they invite everyone who wants to give their lives to Jesus and say, okay, if you repent of your sins, uh, you know, you will be forgiven. Right? Uh, you're not going to, and then you're not going to pray and say, okay, uh, Lord, if it is your will for them to be saved, let them be saved. We don't pray that, right? I hope we don't. <laughs> and we don't say, Father, Jesus, if it is your will for them to be saved, let them be saved. Jesus is like, okay, how do I answer a prayer that is already being answered? I, the cross is for everyone. Salvation is for everyone. Uh, you know, yes, it is my will. That's why I came and died on the cross, right, for, uh, for them to be saved. Um, so similarly, when when we minister of healing and deliverance, sorry, yeah, I think, yeah. Okay, and, and so similarly, when, when anybody who comes to us in healing, uh, we don't pray. We don't need to say, uh, ask, you know, if it is your will, uh, you know, that this person be healed. We know the will of the Father, and we move in that authority as sons and daughters, knowing, okay, you know, I'm representing my Father, right? I'm representing, I'm my Father's ambassador. And I'm not going to mispresent him or wrongly present him, or say something that he is not. He is good. He wants to heal. That is who he is. It is the gift for, of grace for everyone. And so I move in that authority, knowing that, okay, you know, this is my father's child as well. And we minister from that place of love and authority. Amen? So the correct way to, to minister healing and deliverance is to do so knowing full well that God desires for the sick one to be healed and delivered. Amen. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> hope you are with me so far. Um, and so we come to the next uh, question or next section. Uh, we are in page, where are we? We are at page 60. Okay, so another genuine uh, and a sincere question uh, uh, that we that we might have, and that it's not only because it's in the book, but you know, people genuinely ask is, um, since God is sovereign, won't He just heal people if and when He wants to? And have you ever had that question? Like, God is God, right? I mean. He is sovereign. Won't he just heal people whenever he wants to? Yeah. So, see, this is a sincere question many ask and quite challenging to respond to. But there is no doubt that God is all powerful. He can do anything, uh, he can heal and deliver any person in an instant. Right? We can. Let's get that straight. We also know that God is sovereign and acts by his own will. And at any time he desires, no one can stop him. So why doesn't a good, powerful, loving God, a healing and delivering God, just heal every sick person and deliver every oppressed person? Why is there still sickness? Right? Why do I have to go? Uh, why do I see so many sick people? Um, like why do we still? Uh, why do we still see some of our own brethren, even those who have served God faithfully, asked, and who love Him dearly, suffer pain, sickness, and die because of prolonged illness? Why doesn't God, in His sovereignty, just heal them and make them well? Okay, so um, we're going to address this in three different parts. Uh, remember the question. This is the question. If God is sovereign, why doesn't he whenever he wants? So the first thing, first point is the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. The sovereignty of God and responsibility of man. Um, Psalm 115, verse 3 and verse 16 says, But our God is in heaven. 
he does whatever he pleases it's establishing his sovereignty right um sovereign sovereign is uh, simply means single reign so when we say our god is sovereign there has not been another reign of another king or a kingdom that is opposed that was against his kingdom right he has been sovereign from before time began right he is always been so that is who he is right so we see that but our god is in heaven and he does whatever he pleases the heavens even the heavens are the lords but the earth he gave he has given to the children of men where right? we've seen this in the previous chapter as well um that and we saw an example of uh, the tenant and the owner right uh, in the the rented house or rented apartment whatever it is um he expects us to partner with him remember com- commission you know uh, we are we've all been commissioned commission we co labor we co partner with god on this and so he expects us to move in faith as so he's determined that he will move based on our partnership with him on our faith with him right that is our responsibility yes now all of you uh, you know individually have responsibilities right uh it is your responsibility that you set the alarm you woke up this morning to join this class it's, it's because you're responsible right you like it or not you want to this, listen to my lecture or not <laughs> you kind of took, took that step of faith <laughs> and and joined this class today right but that's that's kind of being responsible isn't it so we see that god is sovereign and he does whatever he pleases as the scripture says however in his sovereignty right look at the statement right in his sovereignty right he has decided to entrust the earth to mankind and has determined that under normal conditions he will not override man's responsibility and man's decisions okay there's a lot of weight in that statement because uh if we were to do that a lot of things could be violated and so we see god has determined to to do this to the extent that even in the garden of eden when adam and eve were about to disobey and sin god did not intervene although he could have in fact god knew all this ahead of time and yet he still went ahead with creating man and placing him in the garden of eden okay um so consider this god in his sovereignty has provided for the free gift of salvation for all just because salvation has been provided for everyone every individual does not mean every individual automatically gets saved right so we saw that the cross is for everyone and the salvation the gift of salvation is for all but just because salvation has been provided for every individual that does not mean every individual is automatically saved right what do they need to do they need to believe they need to put their faith in jesus of what he has done right so he who believes in the son has everlasting life and he who does not believe the son shall not see life but the wrath of god abides on him okay so on the same lines um when similarly ministering healing and deliverance there are several areas of responsibilities for us as human beings okay to partner with him to co-labor with him a couple of things here one is it is the responsibility of those ministering to grow in grace okay it is your responsibility and it is my responsibility to grow in grace to grow in spiritual strength i have faith and our ability to administer the anointing and power of god right it is your responsibility it is my responsibility to make that move to seek him more to grow more uh, spiritually to mature uh, spiritually right um, it is the responsibility of each individual to take care of their body to believe god's word and to resist the devil and his works god will not do this for us okay 
Okay, so given this understanding, we do not normally see God healing independent of these areas of man's responsibility. He has sovereignly determined not to do so. This is one side to God's sovereignty. This is one side of the coin, so to speak. But having said all of that, there are occasions when God decides to move despite man's failure. Okay, so now this is the other side of his sovereignty. Okay, so one side of the sovereignty is that it is our responsibility to grow in strength, grow in faith, to seek him, to pursue him, right? Uh, for asking, asking him to anoint us, to move and do what he did in earthly ministry because he's commissioned us to do. That's one of our responsibilities. But then there's the other side of the story is that where he, dis he chooses to move despite man's failures in the two areas A and B mentioned and still cause healing and deliverance. Now, these are exceptions that we see and not the norm. Okay, these are ex exceptions that we see and not the norm. What is the norm is that we partner with him. We take our responsibility. Okay, we learn to minister and administer healing and deliverance. Okay, the two sides of the same coin in understanding God's sovereignty. And the next thing is the sovereignty of God and the exercise of faith, right? The sovereignty of God and the exercise of faith. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 58, it says, Now he did, he did not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. In Mark chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, it says, Now he could do, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and he healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit uh, teaching. Uh, there's another passage uh, from Matthew um, in Mark chapter 9, from 17 onwards, Mark chapter 9, or 17 onwards. We'll read that a little later. Um, um, yeah. But, so Jesus was... In his uh, at home in his in his own country Nazareth, right, where he had grown up as carpenter's son. So that uh, and we know that right. And not a lot of people believed in him. Uh, it's like it's Jesus. We know who he is, but isn't he? You know, isn't he Joseph's son? Is that carpenter's son, right? And they just could not accept uh, or believe the fact that one of their own is moving in the supernatural, right? Uh, so that's, we, we all know that story, right? So Jesus was back at home in his own country, Nazareth, where he had grown up as a carpenter's son to the age of 30. But people in his own country were unable to receive him as who he was. They saw him as a carpenter's son rather than one sent from God, anointed to heal and deliver. Now, why is this important, right? In such an environment, Jesus did not do many mighty works because of their unbelief, right? The atmosphere, the environment, uh, it must have really been strong for Jesus to feel that way, right? And this verse, uh, it says, um, says he marveled because of their unbelief. He was amazed uh, in a very negative way. Um, and so, see, if God is sovereign, all-powerful above all others, and independent of all others, in whom no one can stop, why does he still require his people to exercise personal faith to experience his mighty workings in their lives? Right? It may seem conflicting that our God is almighty and sovereign, and yet God may be limited by our unbelief. Okay, I feel like I need to read that again. It may seem conflicting, that our God is almighty and sovereign, and yet he may be limited by our unbelief. Our unbelief must be really strong to stop an all-powerful and all-knowing God. Isn't it? Right? I mean, and that's dangerous to see that, you know, okay, your unbelief, my unbelief, can stop an all-powerful God from moving. Um, 
that's just has to be you know in the back of our head so you know, it's just a few things uh, for us to consider God in his wisdom has deemed it fit that these two apparently conflicting attributes coexist like there are so many things uh, you know in his nature that that exist you know where logic can, cannot explain the common sense kind of takes a back seat uh, this is one of them right uh, like trinity is an uh, is another thing how is it three and one but it seems to coexist right this, so this is another thing god in his wisdom has deemed it fit that these two apparently conflicting attributes coexist what were the two one we see that he is all powerful all knowing he is sovereign yet he waits on us to to partner with him to labor with him uh, to move in faith in in belief and minister along with him and he longs for that partnership right um, and and you see that time and time again when you read the bible and you see in the life of abraham uh, god does not need to have that conversation with abraham i'm going to destroy the city and he could just go ahead and do it right away why would he have to want to have a discussion with abraham and then then abraham is having this dialogue with him as well this is as tempty okay i'll wait and then this is one it's 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 almost like god wanted to have that conversation with abraham right in another instance in the book of exodus we see uh you know when moses and god are having this conversation and god says like that this stiff neck people uh you know i'm going to i i you know they're just testing my patience um, i'm going to kill them all and moses is like well, first of all they are not my people they are your people <laughs> uh you know i didn't want to do this you asked me to do it and god's like oh yeah you know uh this is beautiful this i think he longs to partner with his people he just longs to partner with you and you where he wants is this I, i don't understand this part of him uh, where he just wants to hold our hands and move and minister when he can do all of it by himself isn't that wonderful right there there are certain things uh, in the second point here it says there are certain things that depend uh, solely on the sovereignty of god such as god's eternal purpose and his plan for the ages these will be accomplished independent of the exercise of an individual's faith and then there are individual purposes that god has whose fulfillment depends on the individual's cooperation with god then there are individual purposes that god has whose fulfillment depends on the individual's cooperation with god in extending all his gifts freely to us out of his grace and yet making it necessary for each one to receive them by faith god is giving every person equal opportunity to receive from him right the realm of faith as it parameters set by the will and the purpose of god is to operate outside of this is to knock against the sovereign will of god right the realm of faith has its parameters set by the will and purpose of god and to do anything out of that is to go up against the sovereign will of god and no one can be successful in doing so right and then finally as a third point we see that we walk by truth that has been revealed and search out what is unknown okay what does it mean okay we walk by truth that has been revealed and search out what is unknown in Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 29 says the secret things belong to the lord our god but those things which are revealed belong to us and are to our children forever that may that we may do all the words of this law okay the secret things belong to the lord our god but those things which are revealed which we can see which which has been unveiled it belongs to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law in proverbs 25:2 it says it is the glory of god to conceal a matter but the glory of kings 
is to search out that matter. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. And I uh, heard someone say that, you know, he, God doesn't hide it from us. God hides things for us so that we can seek and, and, and search it for ourselves. Ecclesiastes 1.13 says, And I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of men by which they may be exercised. Right? So we walk, we, we walk by what we know and we do not let what we don't know stop us. There could be so many questions, right? So we, we pray, uh, we pray for people who are sick, uh, who, who, who need healing. And, and there can be times where we might not have all the answers as to why they are not healed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? Um, we might not know, but what we do know is that He is good and that He wants to heal. Right? So we we walk in that truth. Right? That is the difference between a fact and a truth, isn't it? Fact is that women suffered with the issue of bleeding for twelve years, but the truth is Jesus can heal. Right? So it would be foolish on our part to claim that we have all the answers. The fact is we do not. Okay? It would be wrong to point to someone who we know is faithful to God, one who loves God dearly and would even die for the cause of Christ and say they have no faith. When we see some of our brethren, even those who have served God faithfully, and who love him dearly, suffer pain, sickness, and die because of prolonged illness. And we ask why, and then we, all we can say is that we don't know. Okay, I'm not sure if you've been in that position uh, where you wanted answers to certain questions. Um, and I'm sure we've all been in that place. And I think it's okay to come to a conclusion saying, I don't know, we don't know. We might not all get the answers until we come face to face uh, with him. But what we do know is that he is good. And the truth is that he is our healer. Right? It is in his covenant name. He is a Jehovah Rapha. And so we move once again in that authority. Okay, so you guys see that ministering divine healing in its core is so important for us, for that core to be strong in us. To know that Jesus is the perfect theology, right? Jesus is the perfect will of God. And we minister, we live and we move and do everything the way Jesus did, the way he lived, right? Um, so, that's, that, so that is uh, that is that section of, of Oh, that's the third point. We walk by the truth that has been revealed and search out what is unknown. Right? Um, this is because, okay, um, before we continue from this section, I'll uh, just pause here because uh, I don't want to stop in another five minutes or so. So, um, okay, this, uh, let me just stop sharing. So are, are you guys uh, with me? Um, you know, and I hope you are learning. Um, does anybody have any question uh, that you would like to ask before we take a break? Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so just want to know uh, where would be the balance in the case of um, unbelief and God doing miracles and um, one at such example, uh, like let's say we're, you're praying for one person and that person does not believe, you still pray for that person. And, um, you know, God can heal that person. But I just want to know uh, where is that, uh, you know, sometimes because of their unbelief, we, we see in the scripture that because of the unbelief, God did not do a miracle there. Yes. And also in uh, just one I'm not sure if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the man in the pool of Bethesda, um, yeah. he apparently doesn't have to, uh, and doesn't seem like having that belief that God, uh, Jesus would heal him. 
Yeah. Uh, but we see that he was also healed. So yeah. just want to know where is the uh, balance? Yeah. So uh, so when we minister, and actually, I'm going to address that in, in the next page uh, after the break. At this very point, you know, uh, when we minister, uh, you know, you know, how are we to minister? Right, and I hope it's okay if I if we, you know, if we get to that point and like, answer your question. Yeah, there. sure, definitely. Yeah, uh, but and uh, but when it comes to the man at the pool of Bethsaida, now that is where we see another sovereign move of God. Right, uh, he was not expecting. I, I'm sure he had no faith. Right, all and when Jesus get, got to him, all he said, "Okay, there is nobody to take me." And put me into the waters. Yeah, that's what he says. But uh, that's where we see his sovereign move. Now I'm sure in that pool area there were a lot of people. Right? I don't know how many, um, but I'm sure there must have been a lot of other sick people as well. But that's another question. I don't know. Like you know, Jesus just went to that one person and healed that man, and he and he went away. Um, so for me, that's that looks like a sovereign move of God, where He just steps in and He shows His sovereignty and what He came to do on earth, and you know, in in that He He revealed the love of the Father to Him. And um, but yeah, that's my thing, John. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay that, yeah, and also in Mark chapter nine, one of the scriptures that I mentioned earlier is. Uh, once again, we see a person who comes, um, you know, asking Jesus to uh, for freedom, for delivering his son, who keeps throwing himself into the fire, who is uh, possessed and oppressed, right? And the thing is, in the context of that scripture in Mark chapter 9, I think from verse 17, uh, saying the disciples could not, uh, they prayed, but they could not deliver. And then Jesus starts off by saying, oh, you unbelieving generation, um, yeah. right? And then uh, towards the end of that verse, it's very interesting what this man ends up praying. The father says, Lord, help me in my unbelief. Right? Uh, he's saying, okay. And also, this person uh, was from the same town of Bethsaida. Okay? The very same town where a lot of, four, at least three or four of uh, Jesus' disciples were from. And once again, we'll, I think we'll see that scripture in uh, in. Uh, in the later part of the notes. Um, so Jesus would take, uh, uh, sorry, he, we, this is where we talk about the gradual healing of another blind man and uh, where he kind of leads that person outside the city gates, uh, you know, outside that environment, the atmosphere of, of unbelief to heal them. So, um, so there's, there's a strong, uh, I don't know how to talk about the balance of it, but then there are parts where we just have to believe, you know, just come to the conclusion. Say, okay, this is a sovereign move of God. And then the, in every area that where we can partner with him, we, we have to partner with him in prayer and move in faith. But, uh, I mean, your, your questions also will be answered as we, you know, go to the latter part of the chapter. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Okay. All right, guys, so we'll uh, pause here. I stopped the recording. And uh, we'll take a 10 minutes break and see you in the next session. Okay? See you guys. <laughs>